Good evening and praise Jesus. We continue with our R and R. Today we look at John uh, chapter 13, all the way from verse 2 to the end. I will read. Let me read from verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said, Not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing the feet, their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which one of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Jesus, Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him, since Judas had charge of the money. Some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival, or to give something to the poor. As soon as Je Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. Father, thank you for your word. Pray that you speak to us and minister to our hearts this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. That's a lengthy portion of scripture, but I want us to focus specifically 
on uh, the aspect of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. In our last episode, we learned from John 13 verse 1 that Jesus having loved his disciples, he loved them to the very end. And as we said, that love is an action word. In fact, 1 John chapter 3 verse 18, John writes and says that, Dear children, do not merely love by words, but in truth and by action. So Jesus, keen to fulfill the, um, you know, what love means to his disciples, he goes ahead and performs something that was really contrary to the culture of the time. But even before we look at that, it's important to see in verse 2 that uh, we are told that the devil had already prompted Judas uh, to betray Jesus. When I was reading that portion of scripture, it dawned on me that actually we do not fall into sin in a day's time. It takes a process. You know, when you read in chapter 12, we saw that uh, Judas being the treasurer, so to say, of the group, used to steal some of the money. Um, you know, he used to disguise him as a, himself as a good man who had concern for the poor. But in the truth, he used to steal some of the money for his personal gain. And so we see the devil had been working in him for a very long time. It's interesting to see that the devil achieves nothing in us without our cooperation. And therefore, Judas was entirely responsible for his action uh, of betraying Jesus. It's important for us to remember that the devil is after all of us. Judas was very close to Jesus, yet uh, the devil was able to tempt him and he was overcome by that temptation. Let us remember the scriptures. The scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. He roams around like a, like a lion looking for someone to devour. It's our responsibility to stand alert, to stay sober and to resist him. But even as Judas is about to, to, to betray Jesus, it's also important to see how much love Jesus had for Judas. When you read towards the end, we have just read that Jesus was deeply troubled by the fact that Judas was going to betray him. He had this deep love for him, just as he had love for everyone else. We are also told in chapter 3, uh, in, sorry, in verse 3, that Jesus knew that God had put all power under him. Jesus knew that he was the son of God. He knew that all authority was on him. But knowing that he was the son of God, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul reminds us that he did not use his position to gain advantage over God. And it's important to see the humility of Christ here, even as he goes to wash his disciples' feet. It's important to see his humility before the Father, that knowing that he was God and that everything had been given to him and that he was returning to God, he did not seek to bypass this process. Because at this point in time, he's just a few hours away from the cross. He didn't seek to manipulate God or to bypass this process. He chose to, to go through it all. Because for him, the cross represented, you know, victory. To the eyes of men, to the eyes of his disciples, to the eyes of the world, to the eyes of the devil, the cross was a place of defeat. It was a place of humiliation for Jesus. But for him, he saw it as the culmination of his purpose. The reason why he first came into the world was that he could redeem mankind by dying on the cross, offering himself as the lamb of God to die for our sins. And so he was willing to go all the way. And that is why for him, the cross represented a place of glory. When you read towards the end, we have seen him saying, glorify the son. You know, for him, it was a place of victory. It also shows us, by the way, the humility of Jesus Christ. The fact that he knew that he was the son of God. He knew his identity as the son of God. He did not expect men to treat him better just because he was the son of God. For us human beings, when we are in positions of authority and when we know that we have power over others, we expect of them to treat us, you know, in a particular way. But here Jesus exemplifies and shows that for you to be in a position of authority or leadership, it means for you to serve others. And that is why John says, knowing that he was God and returning from God and returning to God, he got up from the wheel, uh, sorry, from the mill and took off his outer clothing and began washing his disciples' feet. 
Now, this event was very significant in that day and culture because the time for washing uh, people's feet was during uh, a meal when people would have traveled a long distance through the dusty roads. And so as you entered into a house, you would find a slave uh, on the door who would wash your feet so that you would get in the house and, 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 and do the meal. But in this particular instance, Jesus bypassed that process. And while all were reclined at the table, he took it upon himself. He took the role of a servant and began to wash his disciples' feet. And I want you to imagine how awkward it looked in the eyes of the disciples. They themselves could not imagine washing each other's feet, you know, because this was reserved for slaves, in fact, Gentile slaves, and sometimes women. So imagine how they looked at Jesus at this particular point in time. But Jesus, knowing what was going through their minds, in fact, in the other synoptics, it records that they had an argument amongst themselves of who was greater than the other. But Jesus moves to show what it means to be great in the kingdom of God. To be great means to serve the people of God. And so he does this, he washes their feet, and even though Peter refuses, Jesus gives him you know, a reason for him to accept this humble service. And at the end of the day, we see Peter accepting to be washed by Jesus. And so all of these things are significant. And Jesus is doing something very significant to his disciples. And he tells them that you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. That is very, very significant for all of us. Jesus was not just doing it for the sake of being seen as a servant. Jesus was showing his full extent of love to his disciples. But more than that, he was setting for them an example for them to follow because soon he will exit the stage and they will remain as the leaders of the church. And he expected of them not to lord it over the people, but to serve the people that God would entrust unto them. And so this was relevant to them more than 2,000 years ago. It is relevant for us even today that we ought to wash one another's feet. You see, let me give you a challenge. It's very easy for us to wash the feet of Jesus, but it's very difficult for us to wash one another's feet. And what does this mean? In every time and culture, there are services or tasks that are usually, we usually think that they are preserved for those that are law in the society. Think about such things. Think, think about services that you will offer that no one else will be able to recognize, that people will not be able to even notice what you have done. Because at the end of the day, it's not just serving people for the sake of being seen. It's serving to please God and to honor God. And here Jesus is telling us, go and do the same thing. And I can tell you for sure, that place of serving has no competition, especially when you go to look for those small, small, things in your culture, in our culture, that many people are not really concerned about. So I want to give you a challenge. Think about such things. And here in our country specifically, we are headed to a season of, you know, electing political leaders. It's important for us to remember as leaders, as we get into positions of leadership, that the Lord is not calling us into those places so that we can lord it over the people. The Lord is calling us there to serve. And Jesus already showed us by example. And I know this is contrary also to our culture because we expect leaders, you know, to be on the top there, you know, just giving instructions and loading it over the people. But here we are getting a challenge. Let me remind you about Aaron, the priest. In Exodus chapter 28, when the Lord called him into service, he prescribed for him some very particular garments that he was to wear during his service. And he told him that you are to wear on your shoulders and on your breast piece the names of the sons of Israel, so that every time you walk before the Lord, that will serve as a memorial for you to remember to present them before God. In as much as they were going to hurt Aaron, in as much as people will be difficult to deal with, it was the responsibility of Aaron 
to serve those people by presenting them every time before God. And this is what service is all about. So as we think about positions of leadership, let it not be about the position. Let it be about the service that the Lord is calling us into. But also I want to conclude by saying this, that we cannot serve people if we ourselves are not submitted first to the master. We cannot serve people if we have not experienced salvation. The conversion experience is the prerequisite to service. And therefore, if you are looking to go into a position of leadership and you are not born again, this is a challenge to you. But this is also a challenge to us, we who are born again. Every time we pray, we fast, we pray about godly leaders. But very often, do we take up the responsibility to go and ask for those elective positions. I want to challenge us believers that it is a noble thing. It is a noble thing to do because the Bible says that when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked are in authority, the people mourn. Why do people rejoice when the righteous are in authority? Because the righteous have the heart of service, because they will serve the people. The wicked will lord it over the people. So I want to give us a challenge that if you are not born again, you are there and you are not born again. This would be an opportunity because before you serve the people of God, you must first be submitted to him. But it's also a challenge for us that when we get those positions of authority, let us serve the people of God. As I come to a conclusion, Jesus concludes by saying that a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus concludes by the very same words that he started by saying about love, loving one another. And he said that love is an integral part of the community of believers. This is the only way that the world will identify us as true disciples of God, of Christ. And let me tell you, Love is the most effective witness of Jesus Christ in our world today. I want to challenge us. Here Jesus is not telling us to love him in a more special way. He's telling us to love one another. May I challenge us this evening that we may consider to love one another. And love, remember, once again, is not a matter of feelings. It's not a matter of words. It's a matter of actions. And it's not just about going there and showing people that you are serving. In fact, as we study the discipline of service, one of the services we study is the service of hiddenness, being content with the service of hiddenness. Another type of service is accepting the service of others. Here, Peter refused the service of Christ. But one of the ways that we, we can serve is to accept the service of others. When others render service to us, accepting their service. Friends, as we conclude this, um, uh, this, this session tonight, I want you to reflect upon your heart. I want you to reflect at times when you have thought that you were offering service, but you were offering service so that men may see you, so that men may applaud you. I want you to go before the Lord in humble repentance. And from what we have learned today, I want you to receive this challenge about the service of hiddenness, about serving for the glory of God, about serving people just as Jesus has exemplified it here. And I also want you to reflect upon your life and especially if you are in a position of leadership and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to challenge you to receive Jesus Christ. And not only those who are in positions of leadership, but anyone listening to this broadcast tonight, if you've never given or submitted yourself to Christ, there is no way you will ever serve the people of God as God desires if you've never submitted your lives to Jesus Christ. So let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this lesson on service this evening that you have taught us through the example of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. May it come as a challenge to us that, Lord, you have called us to serve your people. Almighty God, to love them by showing or by doing service to them. 
And I know a lot that it is not easy because people will always be difficult. We ourselves are people and we are difficult in our own ways. How hard it is to also lead multitudes who also are weak. Oh, mighty God, I pray that you give us the strength and the courage to serve your people, to serve them with humility, just as Jesus showed us, Almighty God. I pray that love will abound in our hearts, that, Almighty God, we will not despise the people that you've given unto us, that we will not neglect their needs, that, Almighty Father, we will serve them wholeheartedly in the name of Jesus. We also want to pray from the example that we have seen here from Judas, that, Lord, you have reminded us that it is close, it is, it is possible to be close to you, to be church members, Almighty God, to serve also in church, but, Almighty Father, to miss eternal life. Because, Almighty Father, our hearts are not fully submitted to you. Your word reminds us that you, Jesus Christ, you are revealed so that you may destroy the works of darkness. How I pray that we will submit ourselves to you so that, Almighty God, we will be led of you, that we will not fall into temptation, that, Almighty God, we will allow the Holy Spirit of God to work in our hearts, that we will be sensitive to know, Almighty God, that we will be alert and sober, that we will resist the devil, so that, according to your word, he will flee from us, and that we will stand firm to the very end, Almighty God. Thank you, Jesus, because you loved us first. I pray for anyone listening tonight, for anyone who has not surrendered their lives to you, how I pray that they will find it in their hearts to receive the forgiveness that comes from Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you. And for everyone who is listening and are hoping to get into positions of leadership, especially in this nation, how I pray that you work in their hearts. Almighty God, that as they get into those positions, that it will be about serving the very people of God in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you and we bless your name. For this we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. Amen. <laughs>